Section six of the Watergate Report, Volume three. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Final Report of the Senate Select Committee on Presidential Campaign Activities, Volume three. Chapter seven the 1972 presidential campaign of congressman wilbur d mills part two d services rendered by employees of associated milk producers incorporated one summary in august 1971 an appreciation dinner was held for mills in little rock some ampi employees provided services for this function between July 1971 and the end of January 1972, three employees of AMPI worked at various times on the Mills presidential campaign. Two of them applied major portions of their time to the Mills campaign for several months while on the AMPI payroll, one working as an advance man traveling for and with Mills, and the other doing office work. Expenses of these employees including apartment and furniture rental in Washington, D.C., were paid by AMPI. Salaries and expenses of these employees for the relevant period totaled at least $25,000. There is evidence that there was a conscious decision on the part of a top official or officials of AMPI to assign AMPI employees to work in the Mills presidential campaign for a period of at least several months and that Mills's administrative assistant, as well as the head of the Draft Mills campaign, was at least aware of their participation in the campaign. 2. Joe Johnson, Terry Shea, Betty Clement Bullock During Parr's testimony before the committee, he was questioned concerning the assignment of AMPI employees to the Mills campaign. Hamilton the first question is whether or not, in late 1971 or early 1972, there were several AMPI employees who moved to Washington and worked on the Mills campaign while still on the AMPI payroll. Parr. Yes. Hamilton. And who was that? Parr. Joe Johnson, Betty Clement, and Terry Shea. Hamilton. When did they come to Washington? Parr. The best I can remember is November. Hamilton. And they stayed until after you left AMPI? Parr. Yes. Hamilton. And do you know what their combined monthly salary would have been? Parr. I suppose around $2,500. Hamilton. Who in AMPI made the decision to let these three people go to Washington? Parr. Mr. Nelson and myself. After explaining that the employees reported to Charles Ward, chairman of Draft Mills, Parr continued, Hamilton, do you recall any conversations with anybody on the Mills staff or payroll, congressional staff, campaign staff? Parr, I am sure they knew it. We did not try to hide it. Hamilton, can you give me the name of anybody on the Mills staff that knew of this arrangement? Parr, I am sure that Mr. Goss knew it. Hamilton. Is it correct that you sent them to Washington without first notifying somebody in the Mills staff to make the arrangements? Parr. I would not say that. I just did not know the particulars. I am sure that there were some notifications or something that they were there. Mr. Johnson was traveling with Mr. Mills. Parr was questioned further about the type of work these employees performed for the campaign and the amount of time devoted to the campaign. Sanders. Do you know, in fact, what they did for the at least three months that they were here? Parr. I believe that Mr. Johnson traveled with Congressman Mills. I believe Ms. Clement worked in the draft Mills for President Committee, and I believe Mr. Shea was what they called an advance man. Sanders. They were working full-time, or virtually full-time, for the Mills campaign. Parr. Yes. The following facts pertain to the services rendered by Betty Clement Bullock to the Mills campaign, and ampi payment for her services. Congressman Mills and Warren K. Bass, a certified public accountant in Little Rock, 
established a non-profit association called Arkansas Voter Registration Association, which was succeeded by National Voter Registration Association, NVRA. AMPI personnel, including Mr. David L. Parr, Mr. Forrest Wisdom, and Mr. Joe P. Johnson, began to discuss a project with Mr. Bass in 1969. AMPI was interested in information concerning the central United States. Arrangements were finalized for NVRA to furnish AMPI with voter registration information, educate key personnel of AMPI, educate AMPI members, and supply Mr. Parr with any other information he might request. It was agreed that AMPI would pay all of the salary expenses of the association, which totaled $1,750 per month. AMPI paid Mr. Bass $1,000 on May 24, 1971, $1,000 on July 1, 1971, and $10,500 on August 17, 1971, to cover an estimated six months for completion of the project. An AMPI secretary, Betty Clement Bullock, was sent by Parr to work for NVRA in the spring of 1971. For the first few months, her salary of $750 per month was continued to be paid by AMPI. After June 30, 1971, she received her salary of $750 per month from Bass, Another employee of NVRA was paid $1,000 per month. About the 1st of July, 1971, however, Bullock was assigned by Parr to work in the Draft Mills campaign. She staffed the Mills headquarters in Little Rock until the date of a Mills appreciation dinner at the end of August. As explained below, there is evidence that she then began working on preparation for a rally in Ames, Iowa on October 2nd, featuring Mills. On November 1, 1971, Bullock was sent to Washington, D.C., where she assisted in the Mills campaign until February 1, 1972, at which time she became salaried by the Mills Congressional Office. According to Joe Johnson, beginning in September 1971, Clement spent almost every day at the Draft Mills office. Gene Goss stated during a staff interview that Bullock came to Washington in mid or late fall 1971. He said she worked for Johnson and may have had a desk in the Draft Mills office, but he did not know who paid her. At the time of Johnson's campaign assignment, he held the post of Director of Field Services for AMPI's Northern Texas Division. Johnson considered Mills to be an old friend of the Johnson family, Congressman Mills had known Johnson's father and offered Johnson an appointment to West Point Academy in 1947. Johnson's MP salary in 1971 was $25,000 per year. During a staff interview, Johnson advised that in July 1971, Parr asked him to go to Little Rock to help put together an appreciation dinner for Mills. He spent 10 to 15 days on this project, for which time AMPI paid his expenses. Terry Shea worked on the project also. There was Mills for President advertising in the form of bumper stickers, placards, and balloons. During a staff interview, Johnson acknowledged that from September 1971 to January 31, 1972, he assisted in the Mills campaign while on the AMPI payroll. He said in September he only spent about 30% of his time on the campaign. However, in this calculation, he did not include the time spent on the preparation for the October 2nd rally in Iowa, where Mr. Mills was the principal speaker. From October to January, Johnson estimated his time on the Mills campaign to be 50 to 70%, although he said he was working 18 hours per day, and therefore also spending considerable time on AMPI business. He said Parr must have asked him to see what he could do for Mills in Washington. Johnson stated he did some advance work and handled correspondence. He recalled travel for and with Mills to Chicago, Miami, and California. AMPI paid Johnson's expenses. Gene Goss may have been present a couple of times when travel was discussed, but Johnson averred that no one on the Mills staff knew who was paying his bills. According to the Wright Report, 
Bullock said that Johnson worked as an advance man for Mills from September 1971 through January 1972. She said he traveled around the country arranging speaking engagements and taking care of incidental details. She said he helped to organize the campaign of Mills for the New Hampshire presidential primary. Shea did not contribute much time to the campaign until January 1972, according to Johnson. But in December 1971, Shea was designated as secretary for numerous Mills campaign committees established to receive contributions to be subdivided, apparently in view of the gift tax laws. In order to reduce total expenses, Johnson rented two apartments in Washington in November 1971. The total rent was more than $600 per month. In addition to the apartment rental, Johnson and Bullock leased furniture at a total cost of about $175 per month, for which they were reimbursed by AMPI. The apartments and furniture rental cost to AMPI was $6,088.62. The excess over the actual cost for three months of use is attributable to an agreement of settlement with Johnson and Bullock, because the apartments had been leased for a 12-month period. AMPI records reveal that AMPI paid Johnson for additional expenses he billed in November and December 1971, in the total amount of $2,649.38. Thus, AMPI paid expenses of at least $8,738 for Johnson and Bullock. Ward testified that Johnson assisted him on the appreciation dinner for Mills, and thereafter gradually spent more time on the campaign, sometimes a few hours a day, sometimes the entire day. Ward was aware that Johnson, Shea, and Bullock were on the AMPI payroll until the end of January 1972. It was evident to him that Goss and Parr were aware that these employees were providing services for the Mills campaign. It was possible, he thought, that he had asked Parr to furnish help, and that he had even asked for the services of Johnson for a particular job. In mid-January 1972, there was a change in the general managership of AMPI. Harold Nelson was succeeded by Dr. George Merrin. Johnson returned to San Antonio at this time to talk with Merrin, telling him, I'm doing something that you should know about. Johnson was advised by Merrin that his work for Mills must cease, or, in the alternative, that he could take a six-month leave of absence without pay. Johnson decided to terminate his AMPI employment, and this became effective January 31, 1972. Dr. Merrin testified that shortly after he became general manager, he was told by Johnson that there were two apartments which were being paid for by AMPI, with a few people, three or four, I think, although he never stated precisely how many, who were supporting the so-called draft for mills, and who were also on the AMPI payroll and expenses. At the time that Johnson returned to San Antonio to talk with Merrin, Johnson told Nelson that his work for Mills began in November 1971, and that it was at Parr's insistence. Nelson also learned that, in addition to the employees' salaries, AMPI was paying for apartment rentals in Washington, D.C. Nelson testified that at the time he, Johnson, was doing this, he was under Mr. Parr's supervision. In fact, he said that Johnson, Shea, and Bullock were sent by Parr to work in the Mills campaign without consulting him. He said that Johnson and his secretary were working substantially full-time for Mills in November and December 1971 and January 1972. Goss stated during interview that he was aware that Johnson and Shea came to Washington to work in the Mills campaign. However, he did not know who was paying them. Around the 1st of February, 1972, Goss and Johnson went to Arkansas to meet with Mills. Goss recommended that Johnson be put on the Mills congressional payroll. Mills was told at this time that Johnson was doing campaign work. For the months of February and March, 1972, Johnson was in the employ of Mills on his congressional office payroll. However, he was then terminated because of the advice of the clerk of the House, due to his participation in campaign work outside of Washington, D.C. 3. 
other AMPI employees in New Hampshire and elsewhere. Parr testified that still other employee services were provided for Mills during the New Hampshire primary effort. Sanders. Do you know of any other AMPI financial support for Mills in the 1971-72 presidential campaign? Parr. We had some people go to New Hampshire. Sanders. Did you send them to New Hampshire? Parr. Yes. Sanders. How many? Parr. I believe a former state senator of Arkansas, Charles George, and his wife. Sanders. Did you pay for his expenses? Parr. Yes, sir. This is travel, lodging, what kind of expenses he had. Sanders. Car rental? Parr. Yes, sir. Sanders. What was he to do in New Hampshire? Did it have a relationship to Mills's candidacy? Parr. Yes, to see what it looked like. Mr. Holmes also went up there. He was an employee out of Little Rock, had a background in radio and television promotion. Parr said they were in New Hampshire for less than a week. For Johnson's work for Mills in New Hampshire, according to the Wright Report, he was paid by AMPI for expenses of $2,850. The extent of the use of AMPI employees in the Mills campaign is even more evident from remarks of Lilly during an interview conducted by the law firm of Wright, Lindsay, and Jennings. Lilly stated, Tom Townsend spent quite a bit of time on the Mills campaign. Joe Murphy worked for Mills for a week or ten days at a time. Kiefer Howard and Bob Justice would do the same, I believe. E. Expenses of Iowa Cooperative Month Rally 1. Summary October of 1971 was designated by the Governor of Iowa as Cooperative Month. There is evidence that in September 1971, Congressman Mills called the executive director of the Iowa Institute of Cooperation and asked if the director could provide him with an audience to discuss agricultural problems. The director agreed, and a rally was planned. It appeared that Joe Johnson of AMPI told the director that Johnson would take care of all expenses of the rally, and AMPI did provide funds of about $30,000 in addition to $15,000 furnished by Mid-America Dairymen, Incorporated, Johnson arranged for the director to issue an invitation to Mills in Washington, D.C., and the publicity made it appear that it had been initiated by the Iowa Co-op. AMPI provided the services of a number of employees in preparation for the rally. David Parr, an AMPI official, acknowledged that one purpose of the rally was to give prominence to Mills, while there were other speakers at the rally, Mills gave the principal address. An Iowa statewide effort was made by an Arkansas associate of Parr to urge Iowa local co-ops to distribute Mills for President lapel stickers to be worn at the rally. 2. Designation of Iowa Co-op Month The testimony given to the committee by Gerald R. Pepper, executive director of the Iowa Institute of Cooperation, Ames, Iowa, provides a first-hand account of the inception of an October 2, 1971 co-op rally in Ames. For many years, the Iowa Institute of Cooperation had obtained a proclamation from the governor of a co-op month. But until 1971, there had never been a mass rally held during that month to highlight the affair. In early 1971, the governor of Iowa designated the month of October as co-op month. Up until September 1971, a rally highlight had not yet been conceived. Pepper testified, There was never an intent at that point for there to be a program. There was no rally planned. 3. Evidence of Congressman Mills's call to solicit forum. Pepper stated that on Labor Day 1971, he received a telephone call from Congressman Mills. Pepper testified, he said, Mr. Pepper, we have powerful problems in agriculture. He said, I wonder if you would do me a personal favor. He said, I wonder if you would rent the University of Iowa football stadium and fill it up with farm people and give me an opportunity to come out and meet with them. He invited me to call him back at his apartment on the following night. 
and the more I thought about it, the more I thought that, well, this is co-op month, here is a tremendous opportunity to focus attention on this program. Pepper said he notified Mills of his approval. He, Mills, indicated that someone would be in touch with me. Pepper told Mills a preferable site would be the Hilton Coliseum in Ames. 4. Assurance of Financial Backing on the day after Labor Day, the date of the rally was still not selected. Pepper received a telephone call from Joe Johnson, who indicated that he was to get in touch with me to discuss the co-op rally event, and his identification was as a representative of Associated Milk Producers. He advised me that I didn't have to worry about money. The matter of financial arrangements would be his obligation. 5. Congressman Mills is formally invited. According to Pepper, later on the same day, Johnson contacted him again to ask if he could be in Washington, D.C., three days later, on Friday. Pepper told Johnson that he could not do so because of a co-op board meeting on that date, whereupon Johnson offered to transport the entire board to Washington and provide for their meeting on the airplane. Pepper agreed to this, and ten members of the board traveled to Washington on two jet aircraft provided by Johnson. The purpose of the trip was to provide an opportunity to meet Mills. Pepper testified, En route to Washington, Johnson told me that I would be expected to make an invitation to Mills. The board was taken to the House of Representatives Ways and Means Committee hearing room, where a great number of people were in attendance. According to Pepper, the meeting appeared to be under the control of David Parr. Parr was the one who made the introductory statements. Mills came in, and Mr. Parr introduced me, and I offered him my invitation. After Mills's acceptance, the co-op board conducted a brief meeting in the Ways and Means hearing room. An Associated Press wire story, carried in a Des Moines newspaper on March 25, 1974, said that Congressman Mills said, through a spokesman, that he received an unsolicited invitation to speak at the Iowa rally. With respect to this news account, Pepper testified, the remarks of Congressman Mills's spokesman is absolutely incorrect. End of Section 6. Recording by Maria Casper. Section 7 of the Watergate Report, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Final Report of the Senate Select Committee on Presidential Campaign Activities, Volume 3. Chapter 7. The 1972 Presidential Campaign of Congressman Wilbur D. Mills, Part 3. 6. AMPI Employees' Services – Payment of Expenses Pepper explained the implementation of the program. He testified, Johnson came to Ames, and he brought a large delegation of people who were identified as staff members of Associated Milk Producers. These included Forrest Wisdom, John Holmes, Tom Townsend, Terry Shea, and Betty Clement Bullock who appeared to be in charge of the clerical staff in the operation. They installed a number of telephones. They were also using the Holiday Inn as a kind of central headquarters. Pepper said the average number of AMPI employees in September was about six, but occasionally it ranged as high as 15 to 20. The payment of the cost of the rally was explained by Pepper in this way. He, Johnson, established a bank account in an Ames bank, and made whatever deposits he had for the finances of the function. Johnson had the power to draw on the bank account, but Iowa co-op officials did not. Pepper turned over to Johnson a $15,000 check he had received from Mid-America Dairymen. The co-op never made any deposits to the account. As Pepper received bills, he turned them over to Johnson for payment. Payment of bills by the co-op with other resources was minimal, and Pepper did not think that any member associates of the co-op assisted with any of the expenses of the rally. 
The Wright Report relates that AMPI issued two checks to the Iowa Cooperative Month, one dated September 22, 1971, for $5,000, endorsed Iowa Cooperative Month Joe Johnson, and one dated October 21, 1971, in the amount of $18,000, endorsed Iowa Cooperative Month. According to the Wright Report, Pepper was requested to review bank statements and checks in his possession pertaining to the Johnson account and Pepper said they reflected $38,319 deposited to the account. After payment of all expenses, a balance of $1,000 was transferred to the Iowa Cooperative account. Additionally, AMPI directly paid expenses of $6,132, which included $3,751 for buses chartered to transport farmers to and from the rally. Pepper said he traveled around the state by aircraft, the expenses for which he judged were paid by Johnson from sources other than Johnson's bank account. When Pepper was in need of air transportation, he notified Johnson, who would identify the aircraft for me and tell me where it would be at the Ames airport. Parr acknowledged that expenses were to be paid by dairy and local farm co-ops, he said numerous employees of AMPI helped to turn out a large crowd. Parr thought the total cost was 50000 to $60,000, but he did not know what part was paid by AMPI. It is difficult to calculate the total amount which was spent on the Iowa rally by AMPI. Together, Mid-America Dairymen Incorporated and AMPI made direct payments from corporate assets totaling $44,132. In addition, AMPI bore the expense of salaries for perhaps an average of six employees for much of the month of September, and apparently paid for the expenses of two jet aircraft traveling from Iowa to Washington, D.C., and returning, and the expense of Pepper's air travel throughout the state of Iowa, the salary expense might be approximated conservatively at $5,000. The air transportation would surely exceed $1,000. Thus, AMPI and MidAmerica apparently paid in excess of $50,000 for the rally. 7. Promotion of Congressman Mills as a Purpose The question to be resolved is whether the Iowa rally was contrived by Congressman Mills or his supporters as an event to advance his presidential candidacy. Parr furnished testimony that the rally had several agricultural purposes. He was then asked if it would be fair to say that an additional purpose was to give more prominence to Mills. He replied, Yes, sir, I would have to say that. Sanders. Did Congressman Mills receive any prominent notice in the advertisements? Parr. Yes. Sanders, were you touting him for the presidency? Parr, yes, I would have to say I was. Pepper was asked whether he discerned any effort to use the rally as a forum for the Mills presidential candidacy. In response, he told about a letter of September 14, 1971, from Harry L. Oswald, general manager, Arkansas Electric Cooperatives, to rural electric co-op managers throughout Iowa. Pepper described the letter as an effort to get the managers to distribute Mills for President lapel badges to their members for use at the rally. Pepper said Oswald was soliciting support for the congressman to be an active presidential candidate. To offset the effort of Oswald to make a partisan affair out of the rally, Pepper sent a memorandum to the Rural Electric Co-op managers, asking them to disregard any attempt to divert his effort to make the meeting bipartisan. When questioned concerning the appearance of the rally itself, Pepper testified, Muse, was there any effort to solicit any funds by Congressman Mills at the rally? Pepper, no. Muse, and, again, his speech and his actions didn't demonstrate or didn't seek to generate a candidacy, did they? Pepper. As a matter of fact, I thought it was pretty dry. 
however pepper also acknowledged the accuracy of a quote attributed to him appearing in the march twenty fifth nineteen seventy four des moines tribune as follows mills appeared to be testing the water for a possible presidential run nelson testified that there was no doubt but that parr was an early supporter of the idea of mills for president files of the wright lindsay and jennings law firm show that during an interview with lilly he stated dave parr wanted to build a kitty for wilbur mills of two million dollars he said the rally was parr's idea but he did not think it was arranged solely for mills's benefit according to lilly joe johnson had a considerable part of the work in putting that rally together Johnson advised the committee staff that he was the AMPI coordinator for the event, that he spent a couple of weeks working on it in September, and that he made progress reports to Parr. He recalled the use of bumper stickers advertising Mills for president. Townsend testified, I was in Iowa to help wherever I could to try to get a crowd for the Iowa cooperative, he said his function was to get people together and see if we couldn't develop some more cooperation. And then I think, too, I knew that Chairman Mills was going to be one of the speakers at that meeting, and anything I could do to help Chairman Mills I would be happy to do. Hamilton. Was that the official position of AMPI, let's help Chairman Mills? Townsend. I think that may be an unofficial position, he was helpful to us in terms of the dairy industry, and at least I felt that any time there was anything we could do that would be helpful to Chairman Mills, that it would be done. Hamilton. But you perceived it, the Iowa rally, as a vehicle to promote Mills's candidacy. Is that correct, or is it not correct? Townsend. Yeah, I guess I perceived it as... Hamilton. Do you think Mr. Parr perceived it as that way? Townsend. I would think that he would have perceived it as an opportunity to help Chairman Mills, yes. Hamilton. How about Mr. Nelson? Townsend. I would say the same with Mr. Nelson. Early in 1974, some adverse publicity arose concerning the genesis of the Iowa rally, the governor of Iowa expressed the opinion that the co-ops had been used. On March 26, 1974, Pepper sent a letter to Governor Robert Ray, voicing agreement with the governor's opinion. Pepper's letter went on to say, I may have made an error in judgment by falling prey to someone's carefully planned strategy. A carefully staged meeting in Washington was held, in which I officially issued an invitation, I believe now that I had been had, had by experts in political games. The detailed information provided by Pepper concerning the background of the invitation extended to Mr. Mills, including his reported telephone call to Pepper, was not known at the time of the staff interview of Johnson. A full development of the circumstances has been precluded because of Johnson's invocation of the Fifth Amendment, when subsequently called to testify under oath, and by the failure of Mr. Mills to accede to the committee's request for an interview. F. Solicitation of Donations from AMPI Employees 1. Summary In late 1971 or early 1972, David Parr, an official of AMPI, raised about $40,000 for Mills's campaign, by solicitations made to employees, officials, and directors of AMPI. This money was sent to Mills's administrative assistant. Some employees were asked to sign an authorization for a deduction from their paycheck as a contribution to Mills. However, this check-off system was discontinued before it was implemented. 2. Aggregation of Employees' Checks for Mills in late 1971, Parr asked employees, officials, and directors of AMPI to contribute to the Mills campaign. He aggregated about $40,000 in checks, which he periodically sent to Gene Goss, Mills' administrative assistant, as received. Parr averred that no pressure was used, 
and no ultimate goals or levels of giving were established. He denied that any of these contributors recovered their donations by submitting fictitious vouchers to AMPI. Parr claimed that Nelson approved this program. Parr answered specific questions as follows. Sanders. Did you solicit contributions from AMPI employees for Mills? Parr. Yes, sir. I believe the figure raised was about $40,000. Sanders. Over what period of time? Parr. In the fall. Sanders. Of 1971? Parr. Yes, sir. It was sent to me, and I sent it to Washington, I believe to Jean Goss. Sanders. Did you contact all of them personally, or did someone else do it for you? Parr. Everybody was working on it. I mean, all of the employees were working on it. Hamilton. Was there any arm twisting? Parr. I have heard there was, since it's all over with, but I had not heard at the time that there was. I heard that people were told they had to do it. Charles Ward, chairman of Draft Mills, said Parr periodically would deliver to the campaign an aggregation of 4000 to $5,000 in checks. Townsend recalled delivering to Jean Goss a large envelope given to him by Parr. He was told that it contained checks. Jean Goss stated during an interview that in late 1971 or early 1972, Parr's secretary, Norma Kirk, sent checks to the Mills campaign. These represented contributions by dairy farmers and other persons associated with AMPI, the number of which was less than a hundred. In the report of Wright, Lindsay, and Jennings to AMPI, dated March 3, 1974, it is related that Stuart Russell, an attorney for AMPI, disbursed $1,000 by check to Wilbur Mills for president on November 12, 1971. This may be one of the checks which were aggregated by Parr. This $1,000 is included in the total of $44,975.52, which Russell disbursed in 1971 for political purposes, principally through Bob Lilly, and for which he billed AMPI $72,550 for reimbursement. Frank Masters, another AMPI attorney, acknowledged that Parr had solicited a $1,000 contribution, which Masters made to Mills. However, Masters denied that he had been reimbursed for this by AMPI. 3. Employee Checkoff System Dr. George Merrin, who became general manager of AMPI in January of 1972, testified that Parr had initiated a checkoff system for employees of the AMPI Southern Region in 1972. The purpose was to aggregate funds for the presidential campaign of Congressman Mills. Merrin heard of this plan and disapproved it before it was put into operation because of complaints that had been made to him by employees. It was Merrin's understanding that about 65 employees were programmed to contribute about $25 per month. According to Harold Nelson, the previous general manager of AMPI, Parr was calling key employees of AMPI using his personal approach to solicit contributions for Mills. This was in about January of 1972. Nelson said, Mr. Parr is a pretty forceful character, and I do not know what he might have said to these people. Tom Townsend, who worked for Parr, told the committee that Parr initiated the checkoff system for Mills. He stated, I know I signed an authorization to deduct, I don't recall the amount, from my check to be sent to the elect Mills for President campaign. Subsequently, the AMPI comptroller returned Townsend's form with advice that the procedure would be contrary to AMPI policy. The AMPI comptroller, Robert Isham, advised the committee that Parr had undertaken an effort to mobilize AMPI to elect Wilbur Mills to the presidency. According to Bob Lilly, assistant to the AMPI general manager, Parr wanted to build a $2 million cash kitty for Mills. G. Advertising material provided through Walker & Associates, Incorporated. 
1. Summary Walker & Associates, Incorporated, a Memphis, Tennessee public relations firm, billed Associated Milk Producers, Incorporated, in the summer of 1971, for $9,291.53, for the printing of 110,000 bumper strips, bearing Mills for President. The invoice was sent to the attention of David Parr, an official of AMPI, whom Mr. Walker assumes placed the order. This amount was paid by AMPI on August 17, 1971. 2. The Transaction Walker & Associates, Incorporated of Memphis, Tennessee, specializes in advertising, marketing, and public relations. The president, DeLoss Walker, has advised by letter that an order was placed with his firm in 1971 for 110,000 bumper strips imprinted Mills for President. The documentation submitted by Walker reflects that an order for 10,000 strips was placed on April 28, 1971, and an order for an additional 100,000 was placed in July of 1971. Invoices for the cost of this work, totaling $9,291.53, were sent on June 30 and July 30, 1971, to AMPI Attention Mr. Dave Parr. Walker sent this committee a copy of the bumper strip, along with the invoicing and cover letter. Walker stated that he would assume the person authorizing the material was David Parr, since the statement was sent to his attention. Walker, however, could not recall specific instructions. On August 17, 1971, AMPI paid $9,291.53 to Walker & Associates by its check number 8406. 2. Contribution from Gulf Oil Corporation A. Summary Prior to the effective date of the Federal Election Campaign Act of 1971, on April 7, 1972, an associate of Congressman Mills, Carl Arnold, solicited a contribution from Claude C. Wild, Jr. At this time, Wild was Vice President for Governmental Relations of the Gulf Oil Corporation. Wild obtained $15,000 in cash from the controller of a Gulf subsidiary in the Bahamas, which was charged on the books to miscellaneous expenses. Wilde delivered the cash to Arnold for the Mills campaign. In November of 1973, Wilde and Gulf Oil were convicted and sentenced for similar illegal corporate contributions to FCRP. On November 29, 1973, Gulf Oil requested the Mills for President Committee to refund the $15,000, and the request was honored b the transaction claude wild gulf oil corporation vice president for governmental relations gave public testimony before the select committee on november fourteenth nineteen seventy three he stated that about the time of the new hampshire primary on march seventh nineteen seventy two he arranged to give fifteen thousand dollars to carl arnold a close friend who had worked for the american petroleum institute Wilde knew Arnold was also a close friend of Congressman Wilbur Mills, and he assumed that Arnold turned the money over to the Mills campaign. As in the case of the Gulf contribution to FCRP and Senator Jackson's presidential campaign, discussed elsewhere in this report, Wilde acquired this money by calling the controller of Bahamas Exploration Limited, a wholly owned foreign subsidiary of the Gulf Oil Corporation, he asked for a delivery of the sum in cash. The controller drew a check for this amount, obtained the proceeds in cash, and charged the item on the corporate books to a miscellaneous expense account. According to Wilde, this contribution for Mills was solicited by Carl Arnold and was picked up by Arnold from Wilde's business office. Carl Arnold was questioned about this transaction during an executive session of the committee. Sanders. Did you contact Claude Wilde and seek a contribution from him? Arnold. I'm sure I did. Sanders. Did Claude Wilde deliver a contribution to you for Congressman Mills? 
Arnold. Claude Wilde delivered to me a sealed envelope. This was at his office, and he said there was $15,000 cash in it, and I had it delivered to the Mills Committee. I never opened the envelope. Arnold estimated the time of this event as late 1971 or early 1972. He said that Wilde made no mention of the actual source of the money. Arnold continued, I certainly never suspected that it was corporate money. Arnold cannot recall to whom he gave the money. Arnold. Charles Ward was in charge for a while. At some later date, Joe Johnson had the title of president of the campaign. Sanders. Did you, at the time of delivery, did you state that the money was from Wilde? Arnold. No, sir, I would never have done that. Sanders. Why wouldn't you have done that? Arnold. It was none of their business. Sanders. So that, upon receiving it at the campaign office, they would have no way of knowing the identity of the donor? Arnold. I don't suppose they would. As I recall, I told Chairman Mills about it sometime around convention time. I never mentioned the sum to the chairman. I just said that Claude had been helpful or words to that effect. Arnold was asked whether Mills was aware of the magnitude of the contribution, or that it was in cash. He replied, No, that is the kind of question that Chairman Mills doesn't ask, and he doesn't necessarily want to be told either. At a July 1972 meeting of the Gulf Oil Board of Directors, Wilde told William L. Henry, then Gulf's Executive Vice President, that solicitation of political contributions was going on all over the country, and that he, Wilde, had done his share for Gulf. Wilde advised Henry not to pay any attention to solicitation if approached, because he had already done enough. Wilde said that Henry must have assumed that the funds for the contributions came from Gulf's Good Government Fund, which had been established by Gulf's legal counsel to receive contributions from Gulf employees, the specific use which was made of this $15,000 in cash is not known. However, substantial sums of cash were funneled into the New Hampshire primary on behalf of Mills. Joe Johnson, an AMPI employee who worked in Mills's presidential campaign, and who subsequently became campaign manager, stated during an unsworn interview that on a couple of occasions Carl Arnold delivered cash to him in New Hampshire— Johnson did not know the source of the money. Some of the cash was deposited in the Indian Head National Bank of Manchester, and some was used to make direct payments to campaign workers. The largest amount recalled by Johnson on any one occasion was about 5000 to $7,000. On November 13, 1973, Wilde pleaded guilty to a violation of Title 18 of the U.S. Code, Section 610, as did the Gulf Oil Corporation. This statute makes it unlawful for corporations to make contributions to a political candidate or committee. It is also unlawful to knowingly receive any such contributions. The Gulf Oil Corporation was fined $5,000, and Wilde was fined $1,000. On November 29, 1973, the Gulf Oil Corporation wrote to the Mills for President Committee, advising that the $15,000 donated by Wilde was made from Gulf's funds and requesting that it be returned. The $15,000 was thereafter returned. The failure of Congressman Mills to schedule a time for an interview by this committee and the invocation of the Fifth Amendment by his campaign chairman Joe Johnson, when called to testify under oath, have foreclosed a complete development of all circumstances of this transaction. 3. Contribution from Minnesota Mining and Manufacturing Company A. Summary Minnesota Mining and Manufacturing Company, 3M, maintained a secret cash fund for making political contributions, one source of which was a European consultant who billed 3M for services not rendered. The consultant, by previous arrangement initiated by top executives of 3M, then remitted to 3M his receipts from these billings. 
a few weeks before the 1972 Democratic National Convention, the Mills campaign chairman solicited a contribution from an official of 3M. This solicitation was referred to the chief executive officer of 3M, who issued his personal check for $1,000, which was delivered to the Mills headquarters. Later, the chief executive was reimbursed from 3M's secret fund. On October 17, 1973, the 3M Corporation and its chief executive officer were convicted and sentenced for illegal corporate contributions to the Committee to Re-Elect the President from the same corporate source. B. The Transaction For many years, the executives of Minnesota Mining and Manufacturing Company maintained a fund for making political contributions. In 1970, when Harry Heltzer became chairman and chief executive officer of 3M, he became aware of the existence of this fund, although he did not learn precisely the mechanics of how corporate money was channeled to it. Wilbur Bennett, director of civic affairs for 3M, explained that an agreement was reached by 3M top executives with a European consultant, whereby the consultant would submit false invoices to 3M for services, when actually no services had been rendered. The consultant was paid by 3M, and the item was accounted for as an ordinary business expense. The consultant returned the payments to 3M in the form of cash, which was kept under the control of 3M executives. Specifically, it was maintained in the custody of Erwin Hansen, 3M's director of finance, the established procedure for release of contributions from this fund was that the chief executive officer would give his authorization on contributions recommended to him, and this would be presented to Hansen, who would then provide the authorized amount of cash. Before the New Hampshire primary, the Mills for President campaign solicited a contribution from Jerome Schaller, the manager of governmental relations in 3M's Washington, D.C. office. At that time, Schaller did not recommend to his superiors that any response be made to the request. About three weeks before the Democratic National Convention in July of 1972, Schaller received a call from Joe Johnson, the Mills for President chairman. Johnson told Schaller that supporters of Mills were going to try to put on a big effort at the convention, and asked Schaller if he could be of financial assistance. Thereupon, Schaller wrote a memorandum to D. O. Opstad, another 3M official, dated June 19, 1972, to advise of the call. Opstad referred that memo to Mr. Bennett in the headquarters office, with a notation that, even as chairman of W. and M. Ways and Means, he, Mills, is a key man. Opstad noted that request was inevitable, and continued, I am not in favor of assisting any other demo candidate at this time, but believe we should consider here. One thousand to two thousand dollars should be the amount. Bennett told the committee during interview that he received this memo from Opstad. He reviewed it with Heltzer, who wrote a check for a thousand dollars to Mills's campaign on his personal account. Heltzer was reimbursed for this personal expenditure by cash from Hansen's secret fund. Heltzer's check was delivered to Schaller at a Miami hotel. Schaller took it to the Mills headquarters, where he handed it to Terry Shea, who was working for Johnson. It was Schaller's understanding, concerning the source of the funds, that Bennett would contact other executives of 3M to explain the need to make the contribution and then accept any amounts they wanted to give. Schaller said he believed the $1,000 check for Mills was from Heltzer's own funds. He stated that he knew of no indication that any Mills personnel were aware that the contribution came from corporate assets. On October 17, 1973, the 3M Corporation and Heltzer entered pleas of guilty to misdemeanor violations of the Federal Corrupt Practices Act, the basis of the charge was contributions which had been made from the secret corporate fund to the committee to re-elect the president. The corporation was fined $3,000, and Heltzer was fined $500. End of Section 7. Recording by Maria Casper.
Section 8 of The Watergate Report, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Greg Giordano. Final Report of the Senate Select Committee on Presidential Campaign Activities, Volume 3, Section 8, Chapter 8, The Hughes Rebozo Investigation and Related Matters, Part 1. Introduction Senate Resolution 60 mandated the Senate Select Committee to conduct investigations relating to quote, any transactions or circumstances relating to the source the control the transmission the transfer the deposit the storage the concealment the expenditure or use in the united states or in any other country of any monies or other things of value collected or received for actual or pretended use in the presidential election of 1972. That resolution further mandated this committee to quote, determine whether any money, as described above, had been placed in any secret fund or place of storage for use in financing any activity which was sought to be concealed from the public, and, if so, what disbursement or expenditure was made of such secret fund and the identities of any person or group of persons or committee or organization having any control over such secret fund or the disbursement or expenditure of the same End quote. this report reflects the results of the committee's investigation into the receipt storage concealment and expenditure of cash contributions by charles g rebozo and related matters the contributions examined included the receipt by rebozo of one hundred thousand dollars in cash from howard hughes and fifty thousand dollars in cash from a d davis the investigation was extensive and touched at times on incidents involving presidential aides and a wide diversity of government agencies including the department of justice the internal revenue service the treasury department the atomic energy commission the civil aeronautics board the federal reserve board the federal bureau of investigation and the central intelligence agency indeed the list of witnesses interviewed by the committee reflects the number of significant government officials past and present who both aided and inhibited the investigation of this matter the committee received complete unstinting cooperation from certain departments and agencies including the department of justice and its antitrust division the aec the cab and the securities and exchange commission all of whose efforts contrasted sharply with other witnesses and departments of the government however significant conflicts in testimony could not be conclusively resolved by the committee because crucial documents and testimony were not produced in response to subpoenas issued by the committee the principal witnesses who refused to comply fully with subpoenas and provide documents and testimony included charles g rebozo for personal documents and in his capacity as president of the key biscayne bank f donald and edward nixon and a number of Hughes employees in addition the committee in its letter to the president's council on june sixth nineteen seventy four provided substantial evidence relating to rebozo's use of cash funds to the direct benefit of president nixon the purpose of the letter sent by senators irvin and baker was to provide quote, the president an opportunity to comment on this material prior to the filing of this report 
End quote. The committee also hoped to obtain information and documents that would assist in its review of the evidence set forth in this letter. Unfortunately, counsel to the President, in his response of June 20, 1974, chose not to respond to any of the specific evidence on which the committee sought clarification and additional information, except to deny that the President instructed quote, Rebozo to raise and maintain funds to be expended on the President's personal behalf. End quote. In addition, Chairman Irvin, by letter on June 21, 1974, and subpoena, sought to afford Mr. Rebozo an opportunity to respond to the information contained in the letter to the President's counsel. Any assistance Mr. Rebozo's testimony may have afforded the committee and its review of these matters was precluded, however, when the witness left the country and became unavailable for service of the subpoena. Section 1 of the report provides a brief description of the U.S. Nevada operations and U.S. interest in political contributions. Section 2 describes the background and initial discussions of the principles that culminated in the delivery of $100,000 in cash to Rebozo from Hughes, an abortive effort by Hughes's representatives to deliver $50,000 in cash to President-elect Nixon is described in Section 3. Section 4 describes Rebozo's assignments on behalf of the Nixon administration in 1969, including his efforts to raise funds and his responsibility for President Nixon's properties in Key Biscayne, Florida. Section 5 includes an analysis of the delivery of two packages from Hughes of $50,000 each to Rebozo. The section also reviews evidence relating to whether Rebozo retained or used any part of the $100,000 cash contribution, including the efforts by the committee to determine whether any of the currency returned to Hughes had, in fact, been circulated after the dates of delivery to Rebozo. Section 6 describes the attempt by Howard Hughes to acquire the Dunes Hotel and Casino in Las Vegas and the discussions about the pending acquisition between Hughes's representative, Richard Danner, and then Attorney General John Mitchell. Rebozo's fundraising role for the 1972 presidential election is examined in Section 7, including his receipt of $50,000 in cash from A. D. Davis in April nineteen seventy two. While Rebozo testified he retained the used one hundred thousand dollar contribution past the nineteen seventy two election, hoping it could be used in nineteen seventy four or nineteen seventy six. Section eight describes his efforts to return one hundred thousand dollars after the Internal Revenue Service contacted him in nineteen seventy three. This section reviews the contacts Rebozo had with a variety of individuals, including the President and his aides, during early 1973, regarding his ultimate decision to return funds to use. Section 9 reflects evidence received by the Committee relating to the initial IRS investigation of Rebozo and communications the President and his aides had regarding that investigation. The issue of the possible use of the use $100,000 is reviewed in Section 10, which includes an analysis of funds expended by Rebozo on behalf of President Nixon. The analysis reviews the use by Rebozo of his attorney's trust accounts at two banks to pay for expenditures incurred for improvements to the President's key Biscayne properties. Conflicts and testimony relating to significant issues in the report are analyzed in summary form in Section 11. Section 12 is a brief summary of the matters related in this report, including a review of the President's response, through his counsel, to Chairman Irvin and Vice Chairman Baker's letter of June 6, 1974, and the failure of Mr. Rebozo to appear before the Committee to respond to matters set forth in the report. Finally, Section 13 presents the legislative recommendations of the Committee based on this investigation. 
1. Hughes and the Hughes Nevada Operations Howard Hughes moved to Las Vegas, Nevada in November of 1966. Thereafter, Robert Mayhew, a former FBI agent, contracted with Hughes through his own company to provide management services for hotels, casinos, and other holdings that Hughes began to acquire. Mayhew has stated that he was to report on these management matters directly to Hughes and not to executives of Hughes Tool Company. Mayhew testified that as part of his management responsibilities, he was consulted with regard to which political leaders should be supported through political contributions from Mr. Hughes. By 1969, Hughes's cash contributions were furnished from monies from the Silver Slipper Casino, since that entity was owned by Hughes as a sole proprietorship. Mayhew has testified that Mr. Hughes was cognizant of and approved of all political contributions. Those contributions were perceived by Hughes as ensuring access and influence over significant political leaders. Footnote Robert Mayhew, SEC Deposition, March 9, 1973, Volume 3, page 303. See also Memo, used to Mayhew, undated. A copy of the memorandum can be found in the committee files, but one says in pertinent part, Bob, as soon as this predicament is settled, I want you to go to C. Nixon as my special confidential emissary. I feel there is a really valid possibility of a Republican victory this year that could be realized under our sponsorship and supervision every inch of the way, then we would be ready to follow with Governor Paul Laxalt as our next candidate. End of footnote. Because of evidence before the committee that Mr. Hughes had pertinent testimony with regard to political contributions being investigated, the committee requested his appearance by letter, which was never answered. Although a subpoena for Hughes's appearance before the committee was approved by the committee chairman, it could not be served, because Hughes has remained out of the country during the entire period of the committee's investigation. 2. Background of the Contribution Commitment The Hughes contribution of $100,000 to President Nixon's 1972 re-election campaign, which Richard Danner delivered to C. G. Rebozo, was first committed as to the first fifty thousand dollars during the 1968 presidential campaign. Some facts relating to the early social and political ties of Danner, Rebozo, and the president, leading up to this commitment, and the failure to fulfill it in 1968 are pertinent to an understanding of the ultimate delivery of the Hughes contribution. Dick Danner served as the FBI special agent in charge of the Miami area from 1940 until January 1946, when he resigned from that post to manage George Smather's first primary campaign for Congress. Footnote. Danner was special agent in charge from 1940 until 1946, except for one and a half years, when he was in the Dallas FBI office. See also Miami Herald, Thursday, September 5th, 1946, page 1. End of footnote. Danner recalls meeting Charles G. Rebozo in 1940, when he first came to Miami with the FBI. Rebozo does not recall meeting Danner until 1946, when he saw him at the El Commodore Hotel in Miami when Smathers made his decision to run for Congress. Rebozo, a friend of Smathers from elementary school days, also played an active role in the successful 1946 Smathers campaign. President Nixon was also first elected to Congress in 1946, and he and then-Congressman Smathers became good friends in the House of Representatives. Congressman Nixon occasionally vacationed in Florida with Smathers, and on one of these visits in 1947, Smathers introduced Congressman Nixon to Dick Danner. After the 1950 election, when both Smathers and Nixon were elected to the U.S. Senate, Smathers invited Senator-elect Nixon down to Florida for a vacation. After staying with Dick Danner in Vero Beach for a few days, 
Danner and Senator-elect Nixon drove to Key Biscayne, where Danner introduced Nixon to Charles B. B. Rebozo. A. Danner's Version of Contribution Commitment Danner testified that in the midsummer of 1968, he met with candidate Richard Nixon and Rebozo, and was asked to determine if Howard Hughes would contribute to the Nixon campaign. Footnote 20 Hearings, 9497-9503 See also Danner Diary, 1968 Danner placed his meeting with Rebozo and Nixon as a few weeks prior to his meeting with Ed Morgan, which was in late August of 1968. 20 Hearings, 9503 However, Danner also recalled that at the same meeting, candidate Nixon or Rebozo also asked him to check with Clint Murchison, Jr. about the possibility of a contribution from him. Danner's diary shows that he met with Murchison on or about Tuesday, June 4, 1968, which would place his meeting with Nixon and Rebozo prior to June 4, 1968. End of footnote. A. Danner's Version of Contribution Commitment Danner testified that in the midsummer of 1968, he met with candidate Richard Nixon and Rebozo, and was asked to determine if Howard Hughes would contribute to the Nixon campaign. Danner was certain that he had not initiated discussion with Rebozo about a Hughes contribution, since in 1968, Danner had no association with Hughes whatsoever, and, quote, didn't know any of the principals involved, end quote. Danner was sure that either Mr. Nixon or Mr. Rebozo first asked him to check on a possible Hughes contribution at their meeting in 1968. Danner's diary reflects that this meeting with candidate Nixon, Rebozo, and Danner could have occurred as early as April 10, 1968, or as late as July 10, 1968. Danner testified that Rebozo, quote, suggested the possibility that I discuss the matter with Ed Morgan, end quote. Danner was unsure how Rebozo knew that Morgan represented Hughes. Danner's diary from 1968 indicates a long-distance call from Danner to Rebozo on July 23, 1968, during which they discussed Mr. Edward P. Morgan. Danner agreed to talk to Morgan about a possible contribution from Hughes, since he had been working with Morgan on negotiating the sale of the Tropicana in Las Vegas to the Winn-Dixie Company, owned by A. D. Davis and Brothers. Danner's diary reflects that he saw Ed Morgan on August 20th and August 21st, 1968, and Danner testified that he asked Morgan about a possible Hughes contribution to the 1968 campaign. Morgan said he would check on the matter with Robert Mayhew and get back to Danner as soon as possible. Following this meeting with Morgan, Danner's diary shows a call to Rebozo and Richard Nixon to discuss the subject of campaign funds and Howard Hughes, among other topics. Morgan called Robert Mayhew in Las Vegas and explained to him that B.B. Rebozo, through Richard Danner, wanted to know whether Howard Hughes would be willing to make a contribution to the Nixon campaign. Mayhew also recalls that Morgan mentioned that $50,000 was the requested amount for the contribution, and that the contribution should be transmitted in cash. Mayhew said he told Morgan that he would take the matter up with Howard Hughes. According to Mayhew, Hughes felt that contributing through Rebozo was a good means of ensuring access to Nixon, where he elected president. Therefore, Hughes authorized $50,000 cash delivery to the 1968 Nixon campaign, according to Robert Mayhew. Mayhew relayed the approval of Hughes to Edward P. Morgan and suggested that Morgan, Rebozo, and Danner meet to arrange the mechanics of the delivery. Morgan recalled that shortly after he had transmitted this information to Danner, Danner told him that a meeting was arranged at Rebozo's suite at the Mayflower Hotel to discuss the mechanics for delivering the contribution. B. Rebozo's Version 
First, Rebozo states that it was Danner who first brought up the subject of a possible use contribution and not Rebozo or candidate Nixon. Second, Rebozo denied that there was any meeting among Danner, Rebozo, and Nixon to discuss such matters with Rebozo either during or after the 1968 campaign. Rebozo did acknowledge, however, that there were some occasions in the 1968 campaign when Danner, President Nixon, and Rebozo met together. President Nixon has also issued denials that he met with Dick Danner and B.B. Rebozo to discuss a contribution from Howard Hughes. On January 16, 1974, Gerald Warren, Deputy White House Press Secretary, responded to press accounts of Danner's testimony by saying, quote, We have denied that the President discussed with Mr. Danner a possible contribution of any amount from Hughes. End quote. Warren also told the Washington Post that President Nixon has never quote, discussed finances with Mr. Danner. End quote. However, the handwritten notes in Danner's own diary from 1968 indicate that on September 27, 1968, candidate Nixon called Danner, quote, refinances, end quote. Footnote. See 1968 Danner Diary, September 27, 1968, 26 Hearings, Exhibit 8. In addition, Danner also testified that it is earlier a meeting with candidate Nixon and Rebozo to discuss the possibility of a huge contribution. One of them asked Danner to contact Clint Murchison, Jr. about a possible campaign contribution. Danner agreed to make the contact, and did in fact solicit a contribution from Murchison, as reflected by Danner's diary, on or about June 4, 1968. But Murchison had already made other arrangements to contribute to the nineteen sixty eight campaign twenty hearings nine five oh four murchison has advised the committee that he discussed a contribution with president nixon who told murchison to give the contribution to him or rosemary woods washington interview end of footnote c meeting among danner rebozo and morgan Danner, Rebozo, and Morgan met for breakfast on September 11, 1968. At this meeting, Morgan recalls explaining that a contribution from Hughes of $50,000 in cash would be made to the Nixon campaign if there were some assurances that Nixon would personally acknowledge the receipt of the cash. On September 9, 1968, Robert Mayhew had received $150,000 in two checks from Nadine Henley of the Hughes organization, which was to be used in part for a campaign contribution to Mr. Nixon. Rebozo testified that, quote, Morgan wanted to hand the money to the president himself, end quote, but that Rebozo explained to Morgan that the president would never personally accept a contribution. In addition, Rebozo testified that he felt uneasy about accepting a large cash contribution from Howard Hughes through Edward Morgan because of the 1956 loan from Hughes to F. Donald Nixon and because Ed Morgan represented Drew Pearson. Danner recalled no request by Morgan to pay the money directly to candidate Nixon, as Rebozo claimed, but testified that the contribution, quote, was to be made through ordinary sources, not to the president, not to the candidate, but whoever was handling his campaign funds, end quote. Danner also recalled that Rebozo indicated his willingness to handle the use contribution at this meeting. Morgan recalled that he had merely asked for an assurance that Hughes received an acknowledgment of the contribution, but that neither Rebozo nor Danner would give him such assurances at this meeting. D. New York Meeting Danner testified that sometime after the meeting in Washington, D.C., when Edward Morgan explained that the contribution would be forthcoming, Danner was told by Morgan that B.B. Rebozo would be contacted to make arrangements for the contribution. Danner said that shortly after receiving this information, Danner traveled to New York City to discuss some campaign matters with John Mitchell and Maurice Stans. 
Dander initially testified that Edward Morgan accompanied him on this trip, but after discussing the matter with Morgan, Danner stated that Morgan was not present in New York. Danner recalled that Rebozo introduced him to Stans and Mitchell in the New York campaign offices. Danner recalled having a brief discussion with Stans and a longer discussion with John Mitchell about the Florida Democrats for Nixon Committee, as well as possible campaign strategy. Danner testified that during his meeting with Mitchell and Rebozo in the late morning, Rebozo was called out of the meeting to answer a telephone call, directing him to meet with some Hughes representatives who were allegedly handling the cash contribution to the Nixon campaign. Rebozo returned some time later, according to Danner, and was, quote, very angry and upset, end quote, because he learned that the meeting was to be with F. Donald Nixon, older brother of President Nixon, and John Meyer, an employee of Robert Mayhew and Howard Hughes, and acquaintance of F. Donald Nixon. Footnote 20. Hearings, 9508. In his affidavit for the IRS on July 5, 1973, Danner stated that Rebozo spoke to John Meyer on the telephone. However, Danner testified before the Select Committee that he did not know with whom Rebozo spoke on the phone. End of footnote. Danner recalls Rebozo telling him that Rebozo was not about to see, talk to, or associate with F. Donald Nixon and John Meyer or have anything to do with them in the area of political contributions. Therefore, Danner testified that Rebozo did not have the meeting with John Meyer and Donald Nixon, and that no contribution from Hughes was delivered at that time. Danner knew of no other attempts to deliver the $50,000 cash contribution prior to the 1968 election. Donald Nixon recalled that early in the 1968 campaign, John Meyer had some conversations with him about how Howard Hughes had made arrangements to make a contribution to Mr. Nixon. Nixon recalled that Meyer commented to him that Meyer and Robert Mayhew wanted to make some arrangements for a contribution. Nixon also recalled that John Meyer wanted to get together with B.B. Rebozo and Donald Nixon in 1968 during the campaign. However, Nixon recalled that B.B. Rebozo canceled the meeting that was supposed to be held among Meyer, Nixon, and Rebozo when he found out that John Meyer was going to be involved. Rebozo testified that he met once with F. Donald Nixon and John Meyer during the 1968 campaign but that there was no connection between the meeting and his refusal to accept the $50,000 contribution. Rebozo testified subsequently that the presence of Meyer and Nixon in New York, quote, would have added to my, Rebozo's, rationale, end quote, in refusing to accept the money. Danner testified that his meeting in New York with Rebozo and Mitchell occurred after his meeting with Morgan and Rebozo, in Washington, D.C. However, hotel records from New York hotels from the summer and fall of 1968 indicate that the only dates on which both John Meyer and F. Donald Nixon were staying in New York were from July 7 through July 10, 1968, at the New York Hilton. In addition, John Meyer testified before the SEC that he had dinner with Donald Nixon on July 8, 1968, at which time he met B.B. Rebozo. Furthermore, Danner's own 1968 diary shows that Danner was in New York City on Monday, July 8, 1968, for meetings with, quote, John Mitchell, Tom Evans, et al., end quote. Finally, former Attorney General John Mitchell recalled meeting Dick Danner in New York prior to the Republican convention in the summer of 1968. Mitchell recalled that Howard Hughes contributed to the 1968 campaign, but he could not recall any discussion of the contribution at his summer meeting with Danner. Nadine Henley, senior vice president of the Summa Corp., testified that on July 30, 1968, three weeks after the New York meeting, Robert Mayhew told her that Howard Hughes had approved a $50,000 contribution to both the Nixon and the Humphrey presidential campaigns. 3. Attempted Contribution at Palm Springs Robert Mayhew's telephone messages indicate 
that he was called on november twenty second nineteen sixty eight by a stephen craig of president-elect nixon's office concerning a possible campaign contribution since the campaign had a deficit of eight hundred thousand dollars mayhew recalled having a conversation with howard hughes after the election in which mayhew was instructed to make arrangements through then governor paul laxalt to make the promised fifty thousand dollar cash contribution to president-elect nixon mayhew testified that he approached governor laxalt who agreed to do what he could to help mayhew effect the delivery of the contribution former governor laxalt however recalled that mayhew contacted him some time after the nineteen sixty eight election to discuss fulfilling a campaign pledge made through robert finch the national republican campaign committee laxalt recalled that he agreed to set up a meeting between mayhew and representatives of president-elect nixon during the republican governor's conference in palm springs california on december sixth nineteen sixty eight laxalt says that he had no plans to contact anyone in particular on the nixon staff to arrange for the delivery and that he certainly did not contemplate or plan any mayhew nixon meeting robert finch recalled only that former governor laxalt called him to set up a meeting of the western governors with president-elect nixon finch said he had no knowledge of any meeting between robert mayhew and president-elect nixon nadine henley recalled that in early december nineteen sixty eight robert mayhew requested fifty thousand dollars in cash from her in order to make a campaign contribution to richard nixon to cover campaign deficiencies in the nineteen sixty eight campaign in addition on december five nineteen sixty eight robert mayhew received fifty thousand dollars and one hundred dollar bills from the cage at sands casino therefore robert mayhew appears to have received approximately one hundred thousand dollars and one hundred dollar bills on or about december fifth and sixth nineteen sixty eight prior to his trip to palm springs perhaps coincidentally on thursday december fifth nineteen sixty eight richard danner flew from miami to las vegas to have discussions with robert mayhew about possible employment by the used tool company as manager of the frontier hotel danner testified that he met with robert mayhew and others in the late afternoon of december fifth nineteen sixty eight and that he also saw mayhew again on december sixth nineteen sixty eight danner testified that the substance of their discussions solely concerned his possible employment danner emphasized that there was no discussion whatsoever of any campaign contributions nor was danner given any cash by mayhew during the time he was in las vegas on november twenty ninth nineteen seventy two danner told an agent of the internal revenue service that danner and mayhew began discussing the prospective contribution quote, shortly after the nineteen sixty eight election which preceded his employment with hughes tool company End quote. danner's diary from nineteen sixty eight shows that on thursday november twenty first danner received a long distance call from bb rebozo about quote, a house project End quote danner's diary shows five more telephone conversations with rebozo in the week following november twenty first and then a call from danner to rebozo on friday november twenty nine about the quote, project end quote. danner testified that he could not recall what the quote, house project end quote, was or the substance of his conversations during that time with rebozo this time period in late november shortly before danner traveled to las vegas to meet with robert mayhew also coincided with the initial discussions in florida about the purchase by president-elect nixon of the key biscayne home of former senator george smathers however danner testified that he played no role in the purchase by president nixon of his key biscayne home and that he could not recall what the quote, house project end quote, was president-elect nixon flew to palm springs for an appearance at the republican governors association conference on December 6, 1968. There he met for talks with small groups of governors on the terrace of the Walter Annenberg home where he was staying. Mayhew recalled that he received the money from Henley and flew to Palm Springs with Paul Laxalt. Mayhew also recalled driving to the Annenberg residence where Nixon was staying 
and while mayhew waited in the car with the money laxalt went in the home to make arrangements for the delivery mayhew recalled that laxalt returned to the car and said that nixon's schedule prohibited any meeting with robert mayhew danner testified that he was not aware of the attempted delivery at palm springs by mayhew until after he had joined the used tool company in early 1969. When Richard M. Nixon was inaugurated President of the United States on January 29, 1969, the $50,000 contribution committed initially by Edward P. Morgan in the summer of 1968 had still not been delivered to the presidential campaign. End of Section 8 Recording by Greg Giordano, Newport Ritchie, Florida.